So we have many obstetric uh, practices which impact on neonatal outcome. And I mentioned the over-medicalization of the normal labor process. <clears throat> I know labor is painful and we have many uh, ladies in the audience as well. And uh, it's not to uh, criticize the management, but epidural analgesia, as we will see in the next slide, has a significantly increased risk of leading to cesarean delivery. And obviously, you are going to slow down or dampen the contractions because she's not feeling the pain. The pain is part of the process that makes a mother contract uh, the whole uh, coordination of the muscles with the uterine contraction and so on. So if the pain is reduced, the labor process may not progress. That's just common sense. And unfortunately, epidural has become a routine. And timing the epidural earlier than a certain stage, so you're supposed to progress to four or five centimeters dilation before you give the epidural, but the anesthetist availability, the timing. So you may end up giving it before the labor has progressed. And the most common reason for LSE is this failure to progress after epidural. So we are creating a problem. The other problem is earlier induction of labor than is ideal. So we see a rising rate of deliveries before 39 weeks. All of us know that 39 weeks and above is appropriate to deliver. Below 39 weeks, baby has a higher morbidity. But we end up doing inductions at 37 or 38 weeks for various reasons. You may be able to justify it, but whether it is really justifiable or you are justifying for the sake of justifying is a different story. So uh, this leads to induction on a non-emergency basis for many mothers, and then they don't progress in labor. You may give them epidural on top of that, and then there is a rising rate of CS. And the other problem is once you get a cesarean once, your next delivery is likely to have a CS as well. So it becomes a pattern of repeated cesarean extension because you had one. Previously, we used to do early cot clamping and that habit persists, but we need to educate and most of the guidelines for resuscitation have incorporated. Thankfully, the pediatricians are supporting this and we need the uh, championing more and so that the obstetricians buy into it more as well. So this, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time, but this is the cesarean section rates all over the world. So you have an extreme where you cannot afford to do or you don't have the facility. So this is the only group where the cesarean rate is lower than what the WHO wants it to be. So the all the other countries, irrespective of uh, whether it's a developed, developing country or so on, the cesarean rates are increasing year by year. You can see here in 1990, it was like uh, 10 to 15 percent and up to 20 uh, percent. But then in the 2010, and now it's even projected to increase more. And it's ridiculously high in some uh, cities. It goes to 50, 60 percent which is, uh, and this is all over the world. The pattern is similar. You can see in the developed parts of the world, there is no bottom line because uh, lack of facility is not going to be a factor in these countries. The poorest countries in Africa have a flat line because they don't have the facilities to do the CS. That happens in rural settings. Now the SNCU-like uh, settings are available where hopefully they will be able to deliver near the rural parts as well. And we do see maternal mortality because of lack of uh, facilities, but it's improving overall in Asia. It's not as bad as Africa, but uh, this line doesn't uh, give us any hope. It's opposite side, what we said under treatment, but when you come to the affordable level, always the cesarean rates are higher. And this is uh, what we discussed about either you induce with oxytocin or you give epidural, the rate of cesarean is higher. The older the mother, the higher the rate as well. And you can see here what a big difference. If you don't give epidural, it's uh, the need for the emergency CS due to a failure to progress or fetal distress is lower. While if you give, it's almost double or even more. And the same with the oxytocin induction. Again, it depends on when you are much, uh, inducing. If it's a post-term baby, probably they are not going to need CS as much. But again, meconium staining, fetal distress and things may come up. And that's the reason as a mother gets older, if you induce the uh, CS rate is going to be high. So you have to train your uh, team, you have to discuss with the obstetric team. We know that uh, cesarean section has uh, impact on breastfeeding rates. It affects the gut colonization pattern. And this has been shown to have a potential impact on long-term health. So we know that babies born by cesarean in population studies have higher risk of uh, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. We also have a higher chance of early antibiotic exposure uh, through the mother or because the baby has TTN and you end up giving antibiotics in the NICU. So uh, all these are factors which impact the baby long term and also affects the bonding. The breastfeeding, of course, is a lifelong uh, impact as well if it doesn't work well because the mother had CS. So we all know there are multiple reports of uh, preterm and early term births having a poorer outcome compared. So you even the IQ level is five to six points lower. The risk of infection is more, 
uh, the risk of breastfeeding successfully or the risk of needing treatment for jaundice is higher. So obviously all these have to be considered before you deliver the baby a bit premature. So even if it is 37, 38 weeks, the risk is higher. So try to discourage the obstetrician from inducing or doing an elective section earlier unless it's clearly indicated. And we discussed the importance of delayed cot clamping. So actually it's not uh, something which is optional. It's essential because the oxygenation is happening from the placenta within the womb. The baby is born, the lung opens up and the blood from the placenta has to come back to the oxygenation organ, which is the lung. So it's not the blood which should be outside the baby. It's blood that belongs to the baby that has to come back to the baby. So understand this concept and make sure that the obstetrician understands this as well. And uh, delayed cot clamping is not a choice. It's a necessity. So another sad story is the breastfeeding rates around the world. So there are multiple factors for it. Obviously, modernization of care, uh, over-medicalization, focus on uh, breastfeeding being perfect or the mother getting painkillers, cesarean section rates. So you can see, I mean, there is so much effort uh, from the government as well as from the EAP and NNF on breastfeeding, but 46% uh, breastfeeding rates. And most of you would see even in the first month, it drops to 70%. This is uh, around uh, four to six months of age. And United Kingdom, just 1%. And the uh, United States, 19%. Only the poorer countries have a better breastfeeding rate. And uh, obviously, it's a story of occasional uh, formula feed uh, not affecting the breastfeeding. It's a concept that the parents or the family might have. But it's like the camel in the tent story. The camel wants to put the head alone first, but ultimately, it goes into the tent and uh, the shake is pushed out. So. That's a story that you can uh, quote to the parents about uh, why they shouldn't give even a small amount of formula because it disrupts the process of uh, lactation, especially in the first week when the breastfeeding is establishing. If you start giving formula, mother is confused, baby is confused, lactogenesis doesn't progress and you end up failing. So uh, this is a slide which shows the prevalence of delayed lactogenesis is almost proportional to your education level and uh, uh, where you live. So if you are in rural Ghana, it's a natural process. Majority of the mothers uh, continue to breastfeed on their own without much support. There is hardly any delayed or failed lactogenesis. So uh, it comes up to 22%, 35% as you go to the richer states. This is in US. So the same applies to the urban areas versus the rural areas in India where we have more family support. The parents, as they get more educated, they are more anxious about it. And they are worried about the baby having hypoglycemia. What if my baby doesn't get enough milk? Then they ask the doctor. The doctor doesn't have a guarantee that it won't happen. And they say, you can give if you want. And that upsets this process. Again, the medication, the use of painkillers, the use of analgesia, the use of uh, LSES, all these will impact the breastfeeding as well. So this is something we have to focus on. What we are doing for the well-being of the mother uh, in good intention has actually a negative effect on the mother-baby uh, interaction and feeding, etc.